A recent article in The Economist magazine argued not only have macroeconomists been embarrassed by a decade of failed predictions, but they're also losing their edge. One and the same thing you would have thought. This is tonight. I'm Bruce Whitfield, and tonight we speak to economists about their business and get their views as to whether or not The Economist is being fair. Joining me this evening, Tabi Lioka is economist at Renaissance Capital and George Ginos, ETM Analytics Managing Director. First, there are two disciplines we could differentiate between here. George, let's get your view on it. A difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics. What, what's the difference? So micro tends to be more focused on company, more focused on, on specific sectors and developments within a sector. Macro tends to look at things in a more aggregated way. Um, so it's the collection of, of a lot of micro uh, businesses make up a broader industry and that industry together with others make up a broader economy. What would, what would you call the free economics guys then? The guys who say, okay, let's go and investigate the economics of drug dealing. And why is it that most drug dealers live with their moms if drug dealing is such a profitable business? Are they microeconomists or fantasists? No, I mean, uh, I, th I think they're interesting analysts. I don't know that they particularly fall in necessarily into the economics camp, strictly speaking, but uh, they, they come up with some really interesting studies, which, um, if nothing else, uh, teach us about different facets, sometimes of behavioral economics. Um, yeah. that we wouldn't have otherwise known. Tommy, you're a macroeconomist. Yeah. You guys get it wrong all the time. Okay, just to go back Discuss. to... Discuss. Uh, macroeconomics is also, it's a behavioral uh, study, so it's a social science. And I remember my textbook saying that macroeconomics is the study of um, how to make the most out of very little that you have. So um, why we've been getting it wrong in the past 10 years, I think the past 10 years have been very different to the previous five, uh, 10 years. Um, we've had you know, a crisis in 2008 that um, was comparable to the Great Depression. Um, we had uh, a decoupling of emerging markets, and then we had emerging markets faltering. Uh, we now have a decoupling of uh, developed markets. Um, we have all these problems and all these social, economic, uh, financial, industrial uh, problems that are are just, um, I think, are greater than what we had. And I think it's part of development. So the next the decade's years. textbooks are going to be based on the last 10 years of, of examples, by which time the world would have moved on, the problems would have changed, and the textbooks written about the last 10 years will be as irrelevant as the textbooks written 10 years ago about the previous 10 years, if you're keeping up. I think theory is, is a great foundation. So if you don't understand economic theory, you may not understand why things are developing in the way they do. You may not get the forecasting right, um, but I think the theory is, is a great base. Okay, so the theory is a great base, but companies make decisions based on macroeconomic forecasts. So the group economist of a bank will have a hotline to the chief executive and vice versa. Um, and the chief executive will lead an executive team based on what the group economist tells them. The South Africa is going to grow 3.3% and boom, it doesn't. Um, and the macroeconomists never get fired, George. Um, do they get it wrong all the time? I and mean, what do the stats tell us? Well, look, we've done, we've done studies on aggregated forecasts versus reality, and they don't stack up particularly well. So, so you, go, you look at what people said on the 1st of January, on the 31st of December, you look back at their forecast. Exactly. No, we look How? at 12-month forecasts, yeah. and, and in 12 months' time, we have a look at what actually transpired versus what the forecast How was. How bad are they in terms of their inaccuracy? I would have to say it's probably in the order of about 20% accuracy, 20 to 30 Is that an acceptable accuracy? margin of error in macroeconomic terms, Toby? It's unacceptable. Uh, because, I mean, if you're but forecasting, it's a standard. you should get... I think it's... it's in, in the recent past, yet, yes, it has been. Even the Fed and our Reserve Bank for the yeah. first time have actually admitted to not getting interest rates correct and the currency correct. And, and again, it's this cacophony of issues and influences uh, that are causing, especially exogenous factors that are causing, that are making it difficult to forecast. So what is the point? Why bother? So here's, here's the really scary part. Uh, you know, what Tubby's just, what Tubby's just highlighted is, is what frightens me the most, is that you've got your central bank, and we've, we've uh, focused on, on the central bank's forecast relative to the private sector forecast, and there's no perceptible difference. So, the so they're using there, similar models and coming so up with they, the same answer. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so their model might be a little more intricate, a little more sophisticated than, than the private sector models because they've got more resources. But 
there, there's no huge difference in, in the accuracy of their forecast versus the private sector forecast. Now, the real scary part about all of that is, is that they're basing actual policy decisions on the output of those those models, and that's a little bit frightening. Make, for you're me. making a policy decision on something that is tw at least 20% wrong. No, m more likely um, closer to the 60, 70 okay. percent chance <laughs> that it's that it's wrong. So, and and the further out you go, the the worse it becomes. So, so they're what's pretty the point good at forecast forecasting. What is the point of forecasting? Well, I think you need to you need to be able to to take a decision at some point. But but you raise some interesting questions because quite often. Uh, we've raised the point that sometimes um, trying to manipulate markets that perhaps should be left to their own devices and, and left to free market um, dynamics, uh, perhaps that's the better way to go. But that's an admission of having no control. But you do, because if you, if, um, if you forecast, you're providing guidance. So sometimes the market could react to your forecast. Yeah. Look at yesterday. Goldman Sachs came out with the 50... Um, with $40 oil. With the $40 and, oil and, oil and what happens to, for, to, yeah. do, uh, to oil. Markets and correct themselves eventually, though. Exactly. Well, but they I do follow... Yeah. Uh, in the short term, they, they follow what they regard as credible forecasts. Yeah. And, and maybe $40 oil is a reality, or maybe $50 or $60 oil. But we're not going to forecast it, because we'll get it wrong. Because um, everybody's got oil wrong, haven't they? Well, you know, so I think the, the, the more important thing here, and, and, and this is what we advise businesses, so, you know, in trying to, to bring this discussion into something more tangible for, for companies out there, mm -hmm. is that it's, it's not as important uh, whether the RAND is at 10 Rand 60 or, or at 10 Rand 80 or at 10 Rand 50. What, what's important is to know on a balance of probabilities, is the RAND more likely to weaken from here or is the, the RAND more likely to strengthen from but here? But that's a forecast. Well, it is, but it's one that doesn't get bogged down in you, you're playing yeah. in the accuracy of pinpointing things. And, and I think that's a, a far more palatable way of approaching strategy because you can plan around uh, probabilities of, of something happening in a particular direction. It's very difficult uh, to hold people to account for pinpoint forecasts when in the future, the future is uncertain, as you mentioned. Yeah. No but one CEO, really knows. CEOs, Tabi, we want to know, okay, so Tabi Lorca, she tells us the round will be a 1080 at the end of the year. She's been, you know, 20%, she's been within 20%. She's one of the best forecasters on the currency, for example, um, in the country. So we're going to go with 10 round 80 and we base our plans on something specific. Because if you get it wrong, well, then I've got somebody else to blame. Um, <laughs> and I don't have to take responsibility. The economist yeah. got it wrong. Um, is that not why people want macroeconomic certainty? So they've got somebody else to pass uh, they, the back they, they would love that. But I would also put it to you that uh, if, if they are using pinpoint forecasts like that, they should be fired. <laughs> they shouldn't be in that position to begin with because that's absolutely not the way to run a, a, a business. But your example is actually very correct because oftentimes in, in business, especially if you work for a bulk, bulge bracket uh, like a big bank where it's not just investment bank, but you have private bank and mm -hmm. corporate. And uh, The Economist does is asked to have a, an opinion on the end of year, as in the 31st of December, because companies actually base their uh, financial year on that. And I find that very mm -hmm. difficult, and it just doesn't make sense to me, because as an economist, we don't work on the last day of the year forecast. Yeah. Uh, and, and it could change massively. And it's I mean, a if we look at target. I mean, one looks at the world, and is the world awash with more data today, Tubby, than it was, say, 10 years ago? It seems like it. It, it definitely. And is that it's a desperate just, attempt to try and understand it better? It is, I think, a, a way of understanding, but there is more, there's a sophisticated means. I think uh, the fact that, you know, into, um, IT and there's just a lot of resources now and intelligence and we get uh, data much? very quickly. Um, too much is not, it's never a bad thing. Uh, at least we get to understand. Too much noise? I mean, they, it they, is they, too much noise, but but there is also social media that is creating this too much noise, and the you know uh, things happening yeah. in real time that is creating this euphoria and that is moving market and often getting it wrong. So a question one for it, both it, of you. A question for both of you. The times we're living in. A question for both of you. If I was to allow you only three data points upon which to plan, so for South Africa in a global context. You can have any three data points from anywhere in the world. What would those three data points be? George, I'm going to ask you first. I want to see if Tabi uh, correlates with what, with what you might go for. What so, would they be? It's going to be money supply in the US. In the US, okay. It's going to be money supply 
in, and are we talking in the South African context? We look about, about South Africa. We, okay. you, you've got to, so you, you've got to provide information to a South African client sure. for their planning for the globe. Sure. So uh, you, you, you would have to have uh, an in, some interest rate um, um, feeling out there. So I, I would probably go for US, a US bond yield, probably the 10-year okay. bond yield and okay. South African money supply. Okay, so two money supply numbers, South yep. African money supply, US money supply yep. and US treasuries, 10-year yep. treasuries. Yep. Tabby, what do you I was going to say, um, US 10-year, um, US GDP growth and um, RAND. The RAND, yeah. okay. And Scott, two, two economists, different disciplines, looking for different data to give you hopefully the most accurate possible view of what the world looks like 12 months from now. Yep. No wonder it's a dismal science. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a tricky place to play. Yeah. Um, and, and Do you guys I think have a credibility crisis as an industry? Um, I think there, there is quite a lot of that and, and I think that's why there's a lot of value in trying to turn economics uh, very real and making economics very practical. So it's not no longer just about um, understanding what CPI has done, it's, it's about digging into that CPI number and understanding how the pistons of the inflation dynamics are, are evolving that you can give people some real tangible uh, appreciation for what's happening at a price level in the country. But you're going to be wrong. No, not necessarily. Always. Um, you, you, if you, you'll always be able to understand different cycles if okay. you can pick the cycles. So it's, it's picking the cycles that I would value more importantly than anything else, which is why I wanted the money supply numbers, yeah. uh, because that assists us greatly. Uh, and off that, you'll but that tells you about economic activity. It tells you what's yeah, really going on. Yeah, and I think on. the trend is what is important. It's mm. not so when you say it's wrong, you're thinking of the actual number. Yeah, it's not the number that is important. It's the trend that is important. Now this is all nice and good, but it sounds like economists making excuses. Um, would your clients buy this argument, or do they just want the data? They want the specifics so that they could chart at you at the end. It of depends year when what clients. So there are certain clients who obviously wanted, you know, a, a spot price. Um, but they, those who understand that there are a lot of influences, they would want, they understand the trend, they understand that things do change. Uh, I mean, if you look at the past 12 months. Look at oil. Look where we are now. Look, look at, at oil. oil, look at the rand, look at the dollar. Okay, you, you like the currency. Give me rand dollar exchange rate 31st of December 2015, please. <laughs> I say 11.35. 11.35. George Ginos? No, I'll just ignore the question. <laughs> there we go. He doesn't do forecasts. <laughs> Tubby took a hill climb and sing there. Tubby Lioka is economist at Renaissance Capital. And George Ginos, the managing director of ETM Analytics. What a fascinating discussion all around the dismal science of economics. Thank you for watching. There'll be more tonight, tomorrow. Till then, good night and goodbye.